A History of Global Politics, Creating an International Order The world is composed of many countries or states, all of them having different forms of government. Some scholars of politics are interested in individual states and examine the internal politics of these countries. These scholars look at trade between states. They also study political, military, and other diplomatic engagements between two or more countries. These scholars are studying international relations. Moreover, when they explore the deepening interactions between states, they refer to the phenomenon of internationalization. Internationalization does not equal globalization, although it is a major part of globalization. Globalization encompasses a multitude of connections and interactions that cannot be reduced to the ties between governments. Internationalization is one window to view the globalization of politics. So here are the attributes of today's global systems. There are four. First one, there are countries or states that are independent and govern themselves. Number two, these countries interact with each other through diplomacy. Number three, there are international organizations like the UN or United Nations that facilitate these interactions. And number four, beyond simply facilitating meeting between states, international organizations also take lives on their own. So, what are the origins of this system? So, to understand that, we need to understand what's the difference between a country or a nation. A country, or what academics call the nation-state, this concept is not as simple as it seems. This is a modern phenomenon in human history, and people did not always organize themselves as country. At different parts in the history of humanity, people in various regions of the world have identified exclusively with units as small as their village or their tribe, and at other times, they, they see themselves as members of larger political categories like Christendom or the entire Christian world. So, therefore, what is the difference between a nation and a state? In layman terms, State refers to a country and its government. For example, the Philippine government, it is a state that has four attributes. First attribute, it exercises authority over a specific population called its citizens. So the population is also known as its citizens. It governs a specific territory. A state has a structure of government that crafts various rules that people or the society follows. And the most crucial is that the state has sovereignty over its territory. Sovereignty refers to internal and external authority. Internationally, no individuals or groups can operate in a given national territory by ignoring the state. This means that groups like churches, civil society organizations, corporations, and other entities have to follow the laws of the state where they establish their parishes, offices, or headquarters. Externally, sovereignty means that a state's policies and procedures are independent of the intervention of other states. Russia or China, for example, cannot pass laws for the Philippines, and the Philippines cannot pass laws for Russia and China. On the other hand, the nation, according to Benedict Anderson, is an imagined community. It is limited because it does not go beyond an official boundary, and because rights and responsibilities are mainly the privilege and concern of the citizens of that nation. So, let's now um, try to define what are these key concepts here. First is that there is a mention of limited. Okay, what does being limited mean? Being limited means that the nation has its boundaries. This characteristic is in stark contrast to many religious imagined communities. Anyone, for example, can become a Catholic if one chooses. In fact, 
In fact, Catholics want more people to join their community. They refer to it as the call to discipleship. But not everyone can simply become a Filipino. An American cannot simply go to the Philippine Embassy and convert into Philippine citizen. Nations often limit themselves to people who have imbibed a particular culture, speak a common language, and live in a specific territory. Next is imagined. It does not mean that the nation is made up. Rather, the nation allows one to feel a connection with a community of people even if he or she will never meet all of them in his or her lifetime. For example, when you cheer for a Filipino athlete in the Olympics, it is not because you personally know that athlete. Rather, you imagine your connections as both members of the same Filipino community. Finally, most nations strive to become a state. Nation builders can only feel a sense of fulfillment when that national ideal assumes an organizational form whose authority and power are recognized and accepted by the people. Nations and states are closely related because it is nationalism that facilitates state formation. Sovereignty is thus one of the fundamental principles of modern state politics. So let's now go to the interstate system. Present-day concept of sovereignty can be traced back to the Treaty of Westphalia. Treaty of Westphalia was a set of agreements signed in 1648 to end the 30 years war between the major continental powers of Europe. After a brutal religious war between Catholics and Protestants, the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, France, Sweden, and the Dutch Republic designed a system that would avert wars in the future by recognizing that the treaty signers exercise complete control over their domestic affairs and swear not to meddle in each other's affairs. The Westphalian system provided stability for the nations of Europe until it faced its, ma it faced its major challenge by Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte believed in spreading the principles of the French Revolution. So what are the principles? They believe in liberty, equality, and fraternity, fraternity or brotherhood, to the rest of Europe and thus challenge the power of kings, nobilities, and religion in Europe. The Napoleonic Wars lasted from 1803 to 1815, with Napoleon and his armies marching all over much of Europe. In every country they conquered, the French implemented the Napoleonic Code that forbade birth privileges. So, if you're a king or a queen, does not mean that you're superior compared to others. So, it forbade birth privileges, encouraged freedom or religion, and promoted meritocracy in government service. This system shocked the monarchies and the hereditary elites like the dukes and duchess of Europe and they mustered their armies to push back against the French emperor. Anglo and Prussian armies finally defeated Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. That's why you have an expression right now, that is my Waterloo, which means that is my weakness. So it could be traced back to this defeat of Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. So, to prevent another war and to keep the system of privilege, the royal powers created a new system that in effect restored the Westphalian system. It is known as the Concert of Europe. So, the Concert of Europe, the Concert of Europe was an alliance of great powers. The United Kingdom, Austria, Russia, and Prussia that sought to restore the world of monarchical, hereditary, and religious privileges of the time before the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars. It sought to restore the sovereignty of states. Under this Metternich system, named after the Austrian diplomat Clemens von Metternich, the concert's power and authority lasted from 1815 to 1914 at the dawn of World War I. Present-day international system still has traces of this history. Until now, states are considered sovereign 
and Napoleonic attempts to violently impose systems of government in other countries are frowned upon. Like the concert system, great powers still hold significant influence over world politics. For example, in the United Nations Security Council, there is a P5. We will discuss that further in the next chapter. So again, here are the key points. The concert of Europe sought to restore the sovereignty of states. And under this system, um, named after the diplomat Clemens von Metternich, who was the system's main architect, the concert's power and authority lasted from 1815 to 1914 at the dawn. Let's now go to internationalism. The Westphalian and concert systems divided the world into separate sovereign entities. Since the existence of this interstate system, there have been attempts to transcend it. Still, others imagine a system of heightened interaction between various sovereign states, particularly the desire for greater cooperation and unity among states and peoples. This desire is called internationalism. There are two broad categories of internationalism. One, we have liberal internationalism, and the second is called social internationalism. The first major thinker of liberal internationalism was the late 18th century German philosopher, Immanuel Kant. Kant likened states in a global system to people living in a given territory. If people living together require a government to prevent lawlessness, shouldn't that same principle be applied to states? Without a form of world government, he argued, the international system would be chaotic. Thus, Kant imagined a form of global government. La writing in the late 18th century as well, British philosopher Jeremy Bre Bentham who coined the word international in 1780, advocated the creation of international law that would govern the interstate relations. The first thinker to reconcile nationalism with liberal internationalism was the 19th century Italian patriot Giuseppe Mazzini. So according to Mazzini, um, he was both an advocate of the unification of the various Italian-speaking mini-states and a major critic of the Metternich system. He believed in a republican government, which means there is no king, no queen, and hereditary succession. He proposed a system of free nations that cooperated with each other to create an international system. Mazzini was a nationalist internationalist who believes that free unified nations, nation states, should be the basis of global cooperation. Mazzini, was a na Mazzini influenced the thinking of United States President, 1913 to 1921, Woodrow Wilson, who became one of the 20th century's most prominent internationalists. Wilson saw nationalism as a prerequisite for internationalism. Because of his faith in nationalism, he forwarded the principle of self-determination that believed that the world's nations had a right to a free and sovereign government. He hoped that these free nations would become democracies because only by being such would they be able to build a free system of international relations based on international law and cooperation. In short, with, uh, Wilson became the most notable advocate for the creation of the League of Nations. At the end of World War I in 1918, he pushed to transform the League into a venue for conciliation and arbitration to prevent another war. For his efforts, Wilson was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1919. The League came into being that same year. Ironically and unfortunately, for Wilson, the United States was not able to join the organization due to strong opposition from the Senate. The League was also unable to hinder another war from breaking out. So the next war is, of course, the World War II. 
So in the World War II, there were the Axis power. So who are a part of the Axis power? Mussolini's Italy, Hitler's Germany, and Hirohito's Japan. So they were ultra-nationalists that had an instinctive disdain for internationalism and preferred to violently impose their dominance over other nations. On the other hand, these are the Allied powers. So they were against the Axis powers. So um, the members were US, UK, France, Holland, and Belgium. Despite its failure, the League gave birth to some of the more task-specific international organizations that are still around until today, the most popular of which are the World Health Organization and the International Labor Organization. More importantly, it would serve as the blueprint for future forms of international cooperation. In this respect, despite its organizational dissolution, the League of Nations principles survived World War II. The League, was the League was the concretization of the concepts of liberal internationalism. From Kant, it emphasized the need to form common international principles. From Mazzini, it enshrined the principles of cooperation and respect among nation states. From Wilson, it called the democracy and self-determination. One of Mazzini's biggest critiques was German socialist philosopher Karl Marx, who was also an internationalist, but who differed from the former because he did not believe in nationalism. He believed that any true form of internationalism should deliberately reject nationalism, which rooted people in domestic concerns instead of global ones. So according to Marx, he placed a premium on economic equality. He did not divide the world into countries, but into classes. The capitalist class, or the bourgeoisie, referred to the owners of factories, companies, and other means of production. In contrast, the proletariat class, or the working class, included those who did not own the means of production, but instead worked for the capitalist. So there is the middle class and the working class. So Marx and his co-author, Frederick Engels, believed that in a socialist revolution seeking to overthrow the state and alter the economy, the working class had no nation. Hence, their now famous battle cry, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. They opposed nationalism because they believed it prevented the unification of the world's workers instead of identifying with other workers Nationalism could make workers in individual countries identify with the capitalists of their countries. Marx died in 1883, but his followers soon sought to make his vision concrete by establishing their international organization, which is known as the Socialist International. It was a union of European socialists and labor parties established in Paris in 1889, although short-lived, the SI achievement included the declaration of May 1 as Labor Day, the creation of an International Women's Day, and the successful campaign for an 8-hour workday. So the SI collapsed during World War I as the new member parties refused I mean, as the member parties refused or were unable to join the internationalist efforts to fight for the war, Many of these sister parties even end, uh, ended up fighting each other. It was confirmation of Marx's warning when workers and their organizations take the side of their countries instead of each other, their long-term interests are combined. As the SI collapsed, a more radical version emerged in the so-called Russian Revolution of 1917. Tsar Nicholas II was overthrown and replaced by a revolutionary government led by Bolshevik Party and its leader, Vladimir Lenin. This new state was called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic or the USSR. They exhorted the revolutionary vanguard parties to lead the revolutions across the world using methods of terror if necessary. 
Today, parties like this are referred to as communist parties. To encourage these socialist revolutions across the world, Lenin established the Communist International or the Comintern in 1919. The Comintern served as the central body for directing the communist parties all over the world. This international was not only more radical than the socialist international. It was also less democratic because it followed closely the top-down government governance of the Bolsheviks. Many of the world states feared the Comintern, believing that it was working in secret to stir up revolutions in their countries, which was true. A problem arose during the World War II when the Soviet Union joined the Allied for powers in 1941. The United States and the United Kingdom would of course not trust the Soviet Union in their fight against Hitler's Germany. These countries wondered if the Soviet Union was trying to promote revolutions in their backyards. To appease his allies, Lenin, the leader of Russia, Lenin's successor, Joseph Stalin, the leader of Russia, dissolved the Comintern in 1943. After the war, however, Stalin re-established the Comintern as the Communist Information Bureau, also known as the Comintern. The Soviet Union took over the countries in Eastern Europe when the United States, the Soviet Union, and the Great Britain divided the war-torn Europe into their respective spheres of influence. The common form, like the common turn before, before it helped direct the various communist parties that had taken power in Eastern Europe. With the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, whatever existing thoughts about communist internationalism also practically disappeared. The SI, Socialist International, managed to re-establish itself in 1951. But, it in, but, but its influence remained primarily confined to Europe and has never been considered a major player in the international relations to this day. For the post-war period, however, liberal internationalism would once again be ascendant, and the best evidence of this is the rise of the United Nations as the center of the global governance. So this is your activity. In one short one paper, create a Venn diagram depicting the similarities and differences of liberal internationalism and socialist internationalism.